Good morning and welcome to this morning's worship service. Before we are called to worship, uh, allow me to bring a few announcements to your attention. There are a number of them and I ask your attention as we go through them uh, because some way this, the, one of these will apply to you in one way or another. I do want to remind everybody about Wednesday nights. Uh, before the, uh, the COVID outbreak thing that t- took place a couple of years ago, our average attendance on Wednesday nights was 180. Last Wednesday was 270. Uh, we had to set up more tables, uh, which is a wonderful thing. We love it. But it does help us, especially to get those kind of numbers, to be able to plan in advance. So we would ask, if you do plan to come Wednesday, uh, that you would respond to the Evite or that you would call the office and let them know you're coming. And please do come. It is a great time of fellowship. and encourage you to do that. This Wednesday, we also have our blood drive, and so I want to remind you of that. <clears throat> uh, senior hires, this is the last day for you to sign up for RYM, so you want to see Scotty about that. We have our usual men's and ladies' Bible studies and prayer meetings this week, and you can see the back of your bulletin for other opportunities for fellowship and uh, growth and prayer. Uh, This week, you should have received an email from the church about a prospective candidate for associate pastor here at Woodruff Road. It's been almost 20 years since we've brought on a pastor here at uh, the church. But our church has grown to the point where the session has recognized the need for additional staff. Excuse me. Mr. King has spent a number of hours here. This is uh, Taylor King, who has come as a candidate, has spent numerous hours, and I mean that, numerous hours with the session and pastors being interviewed, and he is being recommended to you uh, unanimously by the session and by the pastors. Uh, But you as a congregation will be the ones that vote on him. And so to that end, we want you to get to know him. This week, you'll have the opportunity to do so. He will be here Wednesday through Sunday. Uh, There are a number of occasions where you might have the chance to talk with him, encourage you to do so. Uh, If you look at that announcement, there's a list (coughs) of all the opportunities you'll have to do that, in particular for the senior high, that's the high school uh, families. That's if you have a high schooler, uh, the family of that high schooler, even if they're younger kids, uh, will all be out at the Reeves house at 5 o'clock on Saturday night for a, a Christmas tree burn. It starts at 5. I'm not sure what time it ends. I think it, you could, it might be an all-nighter. Bring your campers, bring your tents. I'm sure the Reeves would welcome you all night there, and they'll serve breakfast to you in the morning. Uh, but this, that'll be a good, there'll be any number of opportunities. Look at that email and see those chances you have to do that. And then uh, next, uh, he will be preaching here next Sunday, uh, morning and evening. And then following that, we will have a congregational meeting where uh, you will have that opportunity to vote on uh, whether you would have uh, call uh, Taylor King uh, to the ministry here. So we do pray, ask that you would uh, pray this week uh, as we have these chances to meet with him, talk with them, that people, that the members of the church would find a, a comfort level and a clarity uh, as they prepare to vote. <clears throat> if you're visiting with us this morning, there is a little card in the pew rack in front of you. We'd ask you to fill that out. Just let us know you're here. If you'd hand it to us afterward, that would give us a, give us a chance to greet you personally, and we would love the chance to do that. Uh, but we also encourage you visitors to stick around after the worship service. There will be a time of fellowship down the fellowship hall, and then we'll have a Sunday school after that. Now, regarding Sunday school, this is a kind of unusual weekend, so let me try to be clear on that. Normally, this time of year, we have what's called the WIC kickoff. That's the women in the church, and then we have the manly Presbyterian hour. Uh, due to some issues because of the, a couple weeks ago with the freeze, we're mixing and matching a couple things, so this is what it's going to look like today. When you go down to the gym following the worship service, it will be divided. There'll be two sections. The first section is for the women and the young ladies of the church. You go in there, get a drink, and sit down at your table. The snacks are at your table. So grab a table, grab a, sna- a drink, sit down at the table, and they will start the program. For the men and for the little kids or for little boys, uh, we will be in the far section. Again, when the lights go off, that's the sign for everyone to go to their Sunday school. That's all the men and kids go to the Sunday schools. Now, for the kids, we have, uh, again, this morning, because we're still part of our J term, uh, the kids will go to the choir room. And so uh, Mr. Rios will be presenting a, uh, uh, do a presentation for them in the morning. The men will all come here for the Manly Presbyterian hour. Okay, hopefully that's clear. If, you, if it's not, to see me afterwards. I'll try to clarify it for you. Also following, again, another issue for today. After Sunday school, 
uh, there will be a College Plus luncheon in the gym. This was supposed to be somewhere else, but because of circumstances, we've had to move it here. So again, we're all going to be stepping on each other's toes a little bit, opportunity to serve and love one another. Uh, but after the uh, Sunday school, there will be this, uh, for the College Plus class, those uh, and those who are serving them will all be down in the gym having a lunch together. If you are leaving the church and you smell a savory dish and you think, hey, I think I'll go get something to eat, it's not for you. This is for the College Plus group and for those who are uh, helping serve them. By the way, this will be, for you College Plus people, this will be the final final going away for Silas and Anna. Last week was the final going away. Today is the final, final going away. Unless tomorrow morning you want to help move him, in which case that will be the final, final, now I really mean it, final going away. And so you want to make sure and uh, give them a hug before they uh, take off to their next calling. In my lesson with the junior high boys on Wednesday evening, we discussed a scene in 1 Kings 22 where the Lord's prophet Micaiah stood before two imposing figures. One of them was the king of Israel and the other one was the king of Judah. He stood before them as they and their prophets pressured him to use his office as a prophet of the Lord to prophesy good things about them. But Micaiah knew the Lord would not bless these kings in their endeavors. And rather than caving to their pressure, he told them the truth, resulting in his imprisonment. Now, why would he do this? We're told in the same passage that as Micaiah stood before the two men, he had a vision of a greater king who sat enthroned over these kings before the prophet. And Micaiah's allegiance was to that king, the king of kings. This morning, as we come to the Lord in worship, we come to the same king of kings that Micaiah did, the king who dwarfs all other earthly kings and kingdoms, who laughs at their pompous presumption and posturing, and who has warned them to kiss the sun lest he be angry. Let's then prepare to worship this king of kings who is worthy of our homage, of our honor, worship, and praise. We'll be called to worship in just a moment. calls us to worship this morning in Revelation 15, verses 3 and 4. You're not a call to worship. 
They sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the saints. Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. For all nations shall come and worship before you, for your judgments have been manifested. The Lord has called us to worship, then let us respond by standing and singing hymn number 219, O Worship the King, a hymn based on Psalm 104. Please stand and sing together. standing as we confess our faith together using the shorter catechism number 26 printed in your bulletin brothers and sisters how doth christ execute the office of a king christ executed the office of a king in subduing us to himself in ruling and defending us and in restraining and honoring all his and our standing as we honor the reading of God's word. 
<clears throat> the Old Testament reading this morning will be in, found in Exodus 12, 1 through 28. Exodus 12, 1 through 28. Hear now the word of God and be prepared for the response following the reading. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth day of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of persons. According to each man's need, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. And they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses where they eat it. Then they shall eat the flesh of that night, roasted in fire with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Do not eat it raw nor boiled at all with water, but roasted in fire, its head with its legs and its entrails. You shall let none of it remain until morning, and what remains of it until morning you shall burn with fire. And thus you shall eat it, with the belt on your waist, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. So you shall eat it in haste, it is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night, and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So this day shall be to you a memorial, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it as a feast by an everlasting ordinance. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall remove leaven from your houses. For whoever eats leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. On the first day there shall be a holy convocation, and on the seventh day there shall be a holy convocation for you. No manner of work shall be done on them, but that which everyone must eat that only may be prepared by you. So you shall observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread, for the same day I will have brought your enemies out of the land of Egypt. Therefore you shall observe this day throughout your generations of an, as an everlasting ordinance. In the first month, on the fourteenth day of the month, at evening, you shall eat unleavened bread until the twenty-first day of the month at evening. For seven days no leavened bread shall be found in your houses, since whoever eats it eats what is leavened, that same person shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he is a stranger or a native of the land. You shall eat nothing leavened. In all your dwellings, you shall eat unleavened bread. Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said to them, Pick out and take lambs for yourselves according to your families and kill the Passover lamb. You shall take a bunch of hyssop, dip it in the blood that is in the basin, and strike the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is on the basin. And none of you shall go out of the door of his house until morning. For the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians. And when he sees blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and not allow the destroyer to come into your houses to strike you. And you shall observe this thing as an ordinance for you and your sons forever. It shall come to pass when you come to the land which the Lord will give you, just as he promised, that you shall keep this service. And it shall be when your children say to you, What do you mean by this service? That you shall say, It is the Passover sacrifice of the Lord who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians and delivered our households. So the people bowed their heads and worshipped. Then the children of Israel went away and did so. Just as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron, so they did. The earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Please be seated. Acts 6 is a great text that illustrates some of the unique features of the church. For example, we read about those in Acts 2, 40 through 47, who gladly received his word, were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. Here we see a demarcation then between those in the world and those who professed to be believers in Christ. We read in verse 42, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and the breaking of bread and in prayers. The people who joined the church sat together under the teaching and the authority of the apostles for instruction and for prayer. We read of the special unity of believers in verse 44. Now all who believed together and, all who had, and, and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all 
as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. In verse 47, we learn the members of the church praising God and having favor with all the people. Then God blessed them. And we read that God added to the church daily those who were being saved. So demarcation from the world, mutual service and ministry, sitting under the preaching of the word, fellowship, communion, and prayer are all part of joining a local body of believers. This morning we have the great joy of introducing our newest members to you. I'd like to invite Eric and Lissa uh, White to come forward. They're non-communing children, Adoniram, Hudson, Everett, Oceanus, and Jubilee. As they're making their way down, also John Chilton, who is their shepherding elder, will join them. If you're not familiar with our shepherding model here at Woodruff Road, every family has a shepherding elder who prays for them, visits them, encourages them, and provides spiritual counsel when they have times of need. Now, Eric and Lissa have already met with the session. We had the joy of hearing how God had worked in each one of their lives already to draw them to Christ. And so I encourage you to also take time to sit down with them uh, to enjoy a time of fellowship, whether it's a Wednesday night or invite them over to your house and hear their testimonies as well. We certainly want to encourage uh, you to get to know the new members here. Let me ask each of you then to respond to the following questions with I do. Do you acknowledge yourself to be a sinner in the sight of God, justly deserving his displeasure and without hope, save in his sovereign mercy? Do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God and Savior of sinners, and do you receive and rest upon him alone for salvation as he is offered in the gospel? Do you now resolve and promise and humble reliance upon grace of the Holy Spirit that you will endeavor to live as becomes the followers of Christ? Do you promise to support the church in its worship and work to the best of your ability? And do you promise to submit yourself to the government and discipline of the church and promise to study its purity and peace? And I made it all the way through that without saying California once. <laughs> Maybe once. <clears throat> Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for the White family, the joy that they've been already in our congregation, how they have plugged in Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. We've just enjoyed their fellowship, their children. Uh, What a joy. Uh, Father, we pray that this would continue, that we would minister to one another, be a mutual encouragement, we'd strengthen one another, and they'd find a great blessing here uh, with this local body of believers. We pray these things now in Christ's name. Amen. In the sermon last week, the text included a discussion between Jesus and Pilate, where Pilate threatened Jesus by pointing out the authority that Pilate had over him. But Jesus responded by telling him, you would have no authority unless it was given to you from above. Well, like Pilate, we often think that our finances are something that we earned in our own merit or by our own power to be used as we will. But just like the issue of authority, you only have finances because God has willed it. And he willed it in part to provide you a means of worshiping him through giving. Let us then remember uh, that we have, what we have is only because our Heavenly Father has graciously provided it to us in the first place. Let us pray. Father, we pray now that as we give, we would do so with a joyful heart, remembering the source of all that we have is from you. And thank you, Father, for providing for us. We pray these things now in Jesus' name. Amen.
Please join with me now in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning as a local body of brothers and sisters in Christ. We come for the purpose of worshiping you, and we do so with one voice. We submit ourselves to your service, and we together express our love for you and our thanks for the gifts that you have lavished upon us, not the least of which is our salvation purchased by the blood of Christ our Savior. We rejoice together that you gave us new life, and you've gifted us with spiritual eyes that allow us to look to you in faith, to reflect on your attributes, and to enjoy fellowship with you, and to worship our most high God. Your word reveals to us that you are the one and only living and true God. You are infinite in being and perfection, a most pure spirit, immutable, immense, eternal, incomprehensible, almighty, most wise, most holy, most free, <clears throat> most absolute, working all things according to the counsel of your own immutable and most righteous will for your own glory. You are most loving, gracious, merciful, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin, the rewarder of them that diligently seek you, and withal most just and terrible in your judgments, hating all sin, and who will by no means clear the guilty. Your holiness and your justice require that you not pass over sin, and yet without compromising your character and truth, you provided a means by which we could avoid the punishment and wrath by taking the punishment upon yourself and the Lord Jesus. And yet we still have remaining sin, and we confess these to you now. We have committed sins of thought, word, and deed this week. <clears throat> we ask that you remove them from us as far as the east is from the west. We ask for forgiveness in Christ and seek restoration of fellowship and enjoyment of you. Mold us into the image of Christ, transform us by the renewing of our minds, that we may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And we give thanks now because we know your answer is yes in Christ. We pray this morning for the authorities around the world as well as in our own country, our city, our state. We pray, Father, for the common grace for them to govern in a manner that is for the good of the people rather than as an opportunity for political gain. We pray, Father, for the Church Universal meeting around the world today for corporate worship. We thank you that we confess the Savior together, and we ask that your Spirit work among your people as they worship and as they will know the joy of communion with you and fellowship with one another. We pray for the persecuted Church and ask, Father, that you will grant grace or relief according to your will. May your people stay strong. May they be a blinding light of a witness for Christ. And may you please uphold them with your strong right hand. We pray for our missionaries around the world and ask that you both protect and provide for them. May they find great joy in service to you. And may you be pleased to grant salvation to the multitudes of souls among all people groups. We pray for the PCA, a denomination more and more torn by division. And we ask, Father, for wisdom during this time that your people will act with patience and integrity, and that we try to address these issues biblically. We pray the same for our own presbytery, Calvary Presbytery, here in the upstate. And we pray for this church. We cannot say, Father, how thankful we are as we gather here at Woodruff Road each Sunday to hear the word preached and to worship together. We thank you for providing for our needs, and we plead with you to protect the peace and purity of this local body so that we might be a light to those around us. We pray for those among us who are sick. Some are fighting chronic illnesses and pain. Some are facing the death of a loved one. Others, the suffering of loved ones. Father, for all these, we ask your loving grace. May they know you more deeply for walking faithfully in the context of suffering. We pray this morning as we hear the word preached and as we sing psalms and hymns that you will give us focus and clarity of thought that we might glean the truth from your word that you want us to hear. We pray for humility to receive rebukes and clarity to receive truth. Among your people gathered here this morning and tonight and in all the activities of this day, we ask that you bless your people, comfort your children, instruct the simple, encourage the weak of heart, strengthen feeble bodies, and draw us near to yourself. And we thank you, our God and Father, Jesus, the Son, and Holy Spirit, for making this possible through Christ in whose name we pray. Amen. I ask you to please stand once more for the scripture reading from the New Testament. <clears throat> it's 
scripture reading for the New Testament is found in John 19, verses 12 through 15. Once again, hear the word of God. From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, saying, If you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friend. Whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus out and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the preparation day of the Passover at about the sixth hour. And he said to the Jews, Behold, your king. But they cried out, Away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's continue in our worship by singing together hymn 282, I greet thee who my sure redeemer art. Hymn 282. Sometimes called Passion Week, other times called Holy Week, began with a focus on the kingship of Christ. You remember that Passion Week began on Sunday, often called Palm Sunday, when Jesus entered Jerusalem to the adulation of thousands. Each one of the gospel writers record the triumphal entry, but Luke's version, let me remind you of what was said on that Sunday. We're thinking chronologically from Sunday to Sunday, the first Sunday. We're told in Luke's gospel, they brought a donkey's colt to Jesus. They threw their clothes on the colt and they set Jesus on him. 
And as he went, many spread their clothes on the road. As he was drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. As Jesus rides this lowly, small animal, the colt of a donkey, into Jerusalem, he's riding in on Sunday when the city is swollen from its normal half a million to over two million. Pilgrims from all over the Mediterranean have poured in to celebrate the annual feast of Passover. And as Jesus and his disciples crest the top of the Mount of Olives and they begin their entrance down into Jerusalem, the attention of the whole city is turned to them. The atmosphere is supercharged. The mood is electric. The streets fill up with onlookers who spontaneously start throwing their outer garments and their palm branches onto the road. It's a way of saying, Jesus, you're too exalted to ride on the same streets as us. You deserve a royal carpet. When your donkey walks on my colt, it's not an in, on my coat, it's not an insult to me, it's a privilege. It's also a symbol of submission. They were in effect saying, you're our king. We're placing ourselves under your feet. The people of Jerusalem immediately recognize the symbolism as is clear from their shouts, as they cry out, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. When they saw Jesus riding in, they knew he was a king. What they didn't understand was what kind of king he had come to be. Although the donkey he was riding in, riding on should have given them a clue. He was not riding on a mighty war horse, but a small colt of a donkey. He was not coming to overthrow the Roman government. He was not coming as a military hero. He was coming as a different kind of king, coming to be the Prince of Peace. Sunday, as the week began, the triumphal entry was about the proclamation of Christ's kingship. Everybody shouted it, blessed is the king. And of course, they all knew very well these things, that the Old Testament institution of king pointed to the Messiah. David and Solomon, they were just a down payment, a foreshadowing of the king, just like every priest pointed to Christ, just like every prophet pointed to Christ. And they knew that a king had been prophesied, for example, in Isaiah 9, of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom. He will order it and establish it with judgment and justice. And then as the week goes by, the week concludes on Friday morning as Jesus just outright says, he is a king. In John 18, 37, when Pilate asked him, are you a king then? Jesus answered, you say rightly that I'm a king. Well, think about the week as it goes on. There's the triumphal entry on Sunday where it begins with the whole city acknowledging Christ's kingship. Monday comes. On that day, Jesus enters the temple, and once again, as he's done before, he clears the temple of money changers. He stays that night at the home of Mary and Martha and Lazarus. Tuesday, Jesus goes back into Jerusalem. He engages in controversy with the Jewish leaders, delivers the Olivet Discourse to his disciples. Wednesday, Jesus goes to Bethany just outside of Jerusalem to the home of Simon the leper who'd been healed by Jesus for a meal. And while there, Mary anoints his head and feet with perfume. Judas goes that evening to the Sanhedrin and offers to betray Jesus into their hands for a price. Then Thursday comes. Jesus gathers with his disciples in an upper room. He washes the feet of the disciples. He delivers the farewell discourse. And then late that night, he's arrested. Then Friday comes the trials, and then the crucifixion and death, and Jesus is laid in a borrowed tomb. But we're going to be examining under the microscope one brief but telling conversation on Friday morning. 
And I want you to notice with me the dominant thread of the week. On Palm Sunday, when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the crowds were shouting and chanting and talking about the kingship of Christ. At the end of the week, on Friday morning, as Jesus is being prepared for execution, the discussion is still all about his kingship. Obviously, this is the dominant running thread of the entire week. We're going to need the help of the Holy Spirit to seek and understanding and to, to gain understanding of this text. You'll need your Bible open because not only will we be looking at our text, but we'll be looking back at our Old Testament text that Pastor Dodds read and you're hearing a moment ago. So I hope you'll roll up your sleeves, prepare to dig into the text, and go to work with me. Let's ask for the Spirit's help now. O blessed Lord, who caused all the Holy Scriptures to be written for our learning, grant us so now to hear them, read them, learn them, inwardly digest them, that we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us only in our Savior and King, Jesus Christ. Amen. Look carefully at our text, John 19, verse 14. You will notice the time stamp is given to us there. Don't read past this. This is huge. We read in verse 14, It was the preparation day of the Passover. This is a textual reminder that Jesus' crucifixion is occurring in conjunction with the Passover. That's the calendar context of these words. That the death of Jesus as our Passover lamb cannot be overemphasized. Now, I know that just a moment ago, Pastor Dodds read Exodus 12 in your hearing, but look back at it with me very carefully. And I want you to notice how this provides the backdrop for all that's happening here. Exodus 12, which had occurred 1,400 years before the coming of Christ. It occurred Passover while Israel was in Egyptian bondage. And what did Passover symbolize? It was a symbol of redemption. God delivering his people from slavery, from bondage. It was that occasion when God's people were protected from the wrath of God by the blood of the Lamb. If they were under the blood, they were spared. But if they spurned the call to place the blood of the Lamb on their doorpost, the death angel would visit their house, slaying the firstborn. Of course, all of this Old Testament ritual, which had been going on now in Jesus' day for 1,400 years, was pointing towards Jesus, who would be the Lamb of God, whose blood protects us from the wrath of God, delivers us from bondage. This week, in John 19, and you need to be able to hold Exodus 12 and John 19 at the same time, this week you have the fulfillment. Jesus coming to be the Lamb, to celebrate the type Passover. As long as the old covenant order lasted, Jesus gave all the ceremonies of the Old Covenant proper reverence and obedience, even up until the cross. So remember, there there are a million and a half extra folks crammed into Jerusalem for Passover. Every room in every inn was packed. Every room that wasn't a room but could be used for occupancy was turned into a lodging for those few days. Folks would have come from all across the Middle East. The city was buzzing with excitement. The whole focus was on the temple. There was, and no hyperbole here, tens of thousands of Passover lambs slaughtered between 3 and 6 p.m. on the afternoon of the Passover. Now, notice what our text says. It says it was the time for the preparation for Passover. What will this preparation consist of? Well, in the weeks before Passover, roads leading into Jerusalem were repaired, bridges were shored up, sepulchers were rewhitened so that all comers would have easy access. But mostly, the preparation focused on the Lamb. Passover was not only a celebration of Israel's national deliverance from the bond of Egypt, 
but it was an annual reminder for all Jews of the need for a perfect bloody sacrifice who would give his life for sinners, the sacrificial lamb. This is why when John cries out at the beginning of our Lord's ministry in John 1, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away sin. Every Jew knew exactly what John was talking about. He's talking about the Passover lamb. Now when you look at this text in Exodus 12, which provides the backdrop for our text, you have instructions for Passover. Now by Jesus' day, these instructions are 1,400 years old. Just a few observations you should make. Look at Exodus 12 very carefully. The timing is given. You'll notice an interesting calendar note. The Passover lamb is to be chosen on the 10th day of the month, according to Exodus 12.3. But it's not to be slain until the 14th day of the month, according to verse 6. So what this means is, the Passover lamb would be chosen household by household by household, and it would be taken into the house, and there it would stay for four days. The children would hold it. They would feed it. It might sleep at the end of the bed. No hurried or last-minute preparations were allowed. The head of the household had to count heads, assess needs, calmly deliberate, and for four days examine that Passover lamb for any flaws, and all day for those four days, the family would deliberate that this lamb, this lamb to whom the children would become very endeared, would be offered on their behalf. And then look at verse 6 of Exodus 12. This lamb was to be slain. Death would either fall on guilty men or an innocent substitute, the lamb. And then we are told that great care is to be is to be given to this lamb who would be slain. It has to be a year-old male without defect. This insistence on perfection in the substitute runs all through the sacrificial system, explaining that what is blemished is unacceptable to the Lord, unworthy of his holiness, and brings a curse on the one offering it. Only a lamb that is perfect is acceptable to God. There's no question that Jesus meets all the requirements to fulfill this type and symbol. For the Father said of him, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. During the days leading up to the final Passover, all through Jerusalem, Jesus' enemies dogged him, questioning him fiercely, waiting him for him to say something they could attack. During all his trials, all six of them, Jesus was repeatedly questioned, passing every test. He had no flaws no sin. This was the examination of Jesus, the scrutiny, so that he could pass the test where everyone would say, he's the, po- the perfect spotless lamb of God. And then notice in Exodus 12 as well, verses 8 through 11, what was every believing Jude to do? Eat the lamb that was slain. This is why Jesus says in John 6, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, you have no life in you. And you'll notice in verse 7 that every part of the entrance of the home, in verse 7, the doorpost, the lintel, is to have blood smeared on it, the blood of the Lamb. The purpose of this act is stated in Exodus twelve thirteen. It's an external sign that all those in this house are numbered among the people of Jehovah. All have been set apart as the household of faith. This blood is a public confession of faith. For anybody who walks by, this family believes God's word and acts upon it. Who's the sign for? Look at verse 13 of Exodus 12. An omniscient God hardly needs a sign to know which people were trusting in him and which people were not. The sign was... As much for the people's benefit, it was for them to look at and be strengthened by. That's why we're told in verse 13, the blood shall be a sign for you. The sign said to them, the death of the lamb has already done its work here. The innocent has died in the place of the guilty. God's justice has been satisfied. Sin is a capital crime, but it's been paid for by the blood of the spotless lamb. As the dad that Passover night. 
would take the lamb in his arms, he'd pull up its head, he would take that knife he'd been sharpening for days, and he would slit its throat. The blood would pour into a basin. The children would cry in the home, having become attached after four days. Dad, why? And the dad would preach the gospel to the children in his house. He would explain that that lamb was a substitute and must die or else they would be judged. And then he would carefully take that blood in the basin and he would smear it on the doorpost and the lintel of his house. And notice the universality in Exodus 12 of condemnation. Israelite and Egyptian would both die if they did nothing. But if any of them killed the lamb and displayed its blood on their doorpost, they would be saved. The Israelite would not have been safe if he would just say, I'm an Israelite, therefore I'm safe. Or if he had just killed the lamb but not smeared the blood. Notice also when the angel of the Lord passes through, he's not looking for the unleavened bread or the barbecuing methodology or the bitter herbs or the basin or the hyssop. He's looking for one thing, the blood of the lamb. If some foolish Israelite would have said, oh, the Lord is passing through tonight in judgment. I'll set my silver and gold on the doorpost. That will be acceptable. Or, I will write out all my righteous acts on the doorpost. Or I will smear the doorpost with my tears. All of those would have brought him nothing but condemnation. Only the blood of the lamb could save. The house itself may have been a beautiful house and sturdily built. But if there was no blood, judgment fell upon the house. On the other hand, the house may have been a miserable hovel, falling to pieces in disrepair. But if the blood of the lamb was upon its shabby door, those within were perfectly safe. The point was being made. The blood of the lamb cleanses from all sin. The Lord doesn't say to Moses and Israel, if the Lord sees the blood and, 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 you're not guilty of <coughs> stealing or blasphemy and murder, then you'll be spared. No. No matter your sin, if you were under the blood of the Lamb, you were safe. This truth is taught to us in the New Testament didactically in texts like 1 John 1, 7. The blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. The Passover lamb was a perfect type of the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, that's why John the Baptist, his cousin, had pointed at Jesus and said, the lamb of God, because all Jews knew that lambs were used in sacrifices, especially the Passover. Jesus was the lamb of God because his life was to be offered as a sacrifice for sins. Like the lamb selected by every Israelite home, Jesus was also in the prime of his life. Like the lamb selected by the Israelites, Jesus was without any blemish or defect of sin. This inextricable connection between the Passover lamb and Jesus is made explicit in this last week of Jesus' life. When he is making his triumphal entry on Sunday in one entrance of the city, at the same time the Passover lambs were being driven into the sheep gate of Jerusalem. Then when Jesus was crucified, families were at the same time killing the lambs in their homes. And fathers were saying, God has provided a lamb for us. Over at the temple, the high priest was killing a lamb to present as an atoning sacrifice for Israel's sin. And at the very same time, Jesus was slaughtered, his blood smearing the posts of wood. That's why verse 14 is so significant. It's, it's saying to everyone who reads the text, Jesus is the lamb. Get it? All the Passover preparations. Well, Notice what the conversation is about in our text. Now, all of that, 
the Passover background. That's just the chronology. That's the time stamp. It's happening under all this symbolism of Passover. But notice what the crux of the conversation is about. Look at verse 14 and 15. It's about kingship. Now remember, this is Friday morning and beginning in Sunday where all of Israel is chanting, except a few grumpy high priests and Sanhedrin members. All of Jerusalem is chanting, blessed is the king. And so that has to come up in the conversation. Look at verse 14. Pilate said to the Jews who were gathered on the pavement below his balcony, Behold your king. And he's thinking, well, this will meet some acceptance. Were in all of these people just a few days ago on Palm Sunday chanting about that? They cried out, away with him, crucify him. And so Pilate says to them, shall I crucify? He's confused. Shall I crucify your king? Weren't you just saying last Sunday he was the king? And the chief priest answered, we have no king but Caesar. Now, Israel had been well prepared for the coming of the king. I want you to think of just a couple of instances in how they'd been taught to think about kingship. Think of the background of Daniel. A couple of years ago, three years or so ago, I had the privilege on Sunday nights to preach through the book of Daniel. A delightful time, the most difficult text I've ever preached, 20-something sermons and my head probably need to be examined for preaching it. Uh, uh, astounding symbols. But what you have all through the book of Daniel is an Old Testament vision of this king. Written hundreds of years before Jesus, Israel had known about the progress of world history, the great kingdoms, and the coming and triumph of the great king. Israel had been carrying this, this message around for hundreds of years the message of the book of Daniel. And so Daniel had spelled it out. He spelled it out in Daniel chapter 2. He, he spells out the vision of this great king. That He speaks of a statue cut up in four parts, representing Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. And then he speaks of these words, The God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. The kingdom shall not be left to other people. It will break in pieces and consume all those other kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. And then later in Daniel chapter 6, a Gentile king writes a proclamation. He is the living God. He is steadfast forever. His kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed. And then again in Daniel chapter 7, the, the pinnacle, the, the crowning vision of Daniel's book, Daniel says... I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. To him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom. And his kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed. So I want you to think about Daniel's writings and how they impacted Israel. When Daniel is writing, he's in Babylonian captivity. Pretty soon, the captives go back to Israel. They scoop up all of their scrolls or many of their scrolls of Daniel's prophecy. They take them back. They become part of scripture, part of the canonical process. But some of those scrolls, we are told, remain in Babylon. Hundreds of years pass by. These visions are just hanging there. Sitting over in the corner of the king's throne room are Daniel's scrolls. In Israel... Those same scrolls are revered as holy canonical scripture, the book of Daniel. We come to the year 3 B.C., 4 B.C. Back in Babylon, the official counselors, cabinet members, historians of Babylon, they reread these scrolls and they re realize the timing that this prophesied king is about to make his entrance onto the world stage. These Babylonian astrologers have no idea where he's to be born, who his ancestors are to be, but they know the king is coming. Then one of these stargazing men in Babylon notices a unique star in the western night sky. He gathers his fellow wise men, understanding from these scrolls dated from the time of Nebuchadnezzar that it was that moment in history when the God of heaven, according to Daniel 2, would appear on the world stage. And as they look into the night sky, 
the star begins to move. These wise men pack expensive gifts. They follow the star hundreds of miles to the east. The star comes to rest over the land of Judah. The wise men go to the first place where they think they would find a king, the palace in Jerusalem. And we read in Matthew chapter 2, the wise men came from the east to Jerusalem saying, where is he who has been born king? In the minds of these eastern wise men, they were looking for the one prophesied in Daniel's scrolls. The star leads them even closer (coughs) to Bethlehem where they give their very expensive gifts. They worship him as the king spoken of by Daniel. And then they go home. But it was not just these Babylonian wise men who were looking for a king. All Israel was looking for a king. You remember they had the prophecy of Isaiah from Isaiah 9. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. He will sit upon the throne of David and over his kingdom. So when Pilate early that Friday morning looks down in Jerusalem from his balcony and asked the Jerusalem biblical scholars, the scribes and priests, gathered outside his front door, shall I crucify your king? They know exactly what he's asking. And notice what they do. They make the fatal error. And this, brothers and sisters, is why I've been waiting to preach this text. They fall into an error that now is 2,000 years old that many in our culture fall for. They state to Pilate, we don't want this king. We prefer civil religion. Look at verse 12 and 15 in our text. The Jews cry out to Pilate, if you let this man go, You're not Caesar's friend. Whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. And then again in verse 15, Pilate said to them, shall I crucify your king? Here's the moment they have. They can say, no, we want to bow down and adore him exclusively. Solus Christus, Christ alone. Their answer is, we have no king but Caesar. The Jews state their preference for civil religion over Christ. At the time of the pinning of the Westminster Confession in the 1640s, the greatest theological scholar, scholarly gathering ever in the history of the world takes place in London. Well over a hundred of the greatest Puritan scholars. And in that gathering, which lasted for several years, as our public theology, the Westminster Confession and Catechisms, was being penned, of all things, civil religion reared its ugly head and was soundly rejected. There's a small group of men who were there at the Westminster Assembly who held to what's known as Erastianism, the doctrine that says that the state should have supremacy over Christ in matters of the church. But our Constitution rejected that and goes on to state these words. The power of the church is exclusively spiritual. That of the state includes the exercise of force. The Constitution of the church derives from divine revelation from the Bible. The Constitution of the state is determined by human reason. The church has no right to construct or modify a government for the state, and the state has no right to frame a creed for the church. They are planets moving in concentric orbits. But the problem that has happened since the first century is civil religion always is nudging its way in saying, you can have both the glory of the state and a savior Just buy into Caesar. Civil religion has been recognized by every major American historian and sociologist as the religion of America. Civil religion is a a religion without Christ. 
a Christless gospel that uses some biblical terminologies. Think of recent presidents when you heard them speak. They would speak using the language of covenant, city set on a hill, but without the need for eternal salvation to be found by faith in Christ alone. Civil religion is, is incredibly adaptable, always to serve the ends of political uses, to make naive Christians think that these power-hungry candidates and elected officials actually care about biblical law and the spread of Christ's kingdom. In my life and ministry over the last 35 years, I've seen candidates and office holders try to co-opt the church, even this church, and get the church to take on Caesar's agenda. Several years ago, right here in this place, during a political race, three different candidates approached me and asked me for support and a platform before this church. They wanted to stand in this pulpit. Three different men. In each case, I tried to very politely refuse and explain to each of them why that could not happen. One of the happiest moments I had was a few years went by and another man was running for another office in our state. And he called me up on a Saturday night. And when I looked at my phone, I thought, I know what he's going to do. I know what he's asking. And he said, Carl, my wife and I are going to be in Greenville tomorrow. I thought, here it comes. And he said, could we worship with Woodruff Road? And I said, of course, you're welcome to worship. And he said, we'd like to come to you in Sandy's house for lunch under one condition. I thought, okay, this is the shoes going to drop right now. And he said, under the condition that you agree to not talk one word about the political race because it's the Lord's day and Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. And so I don't want to have one conversation about Caesar's kingdom. I said, come and sit on the front row, come to my house for lunch and they spent the entire afternoon with us. Their suit got dirty with dog hair from sitting on our couch. It was glorious. Well, I want you to think about civil religion. The same religion as these Jewish high priests. It has now taken center stage in our nation among evangelicals. In worship and church life, I don't care if you're a Republican or a Democrat. Churches think it's a great prize to have a, a president, a senator, a governor, a candidate come and speak in their pulpit. Recently, we've seen in one of the largest churches in our nation, a former president come and stand in the pulpit. Instead of the gospel being preached, you have civil religion. We have family members in a church in Oklahoma City who... During a recent campaign, a church that would never invite a woman to preach invited a candidate to preach. She was a Roman Catholic. And when I asked some of our family members, really, you have women preach? Oh, it doesn't matter because she's going to be the governor. And it doesn't matter, again, if it's Republican or Democrat. We've seen this torrent of civil religion where men have said, well, we would rather have Caesar than Christ. We'd rather have a political powerhouse. We've seen evangelical churches sing as they're called to worship Lee Greenwood's I'm proud to be an American. And that's on their better days. My friend, look at these words carefully in our text. When you see in verse 15, it may be the most shocking statement in all the New Testament. When the chief priests, these men schooled on the visions of the kingship of Christ in Daniel and Isaiah say, We have no king but Caesar. My friend, this is a powerfully sick disease. For the believer, any attachment, listen to me carefully, any attachment to national powers, political persons, political parties can never, ever be mixed with the clear truth of the kingship of Jesus alone. Don't we confess as one of the great solas of our doctrine, solus Christus, Christ alone without any mixture of Caesar. Why? 
We know the history and prophecy. All nations, ours at the head of the list. Listen to me carefully. All nations, all parties, all political ideologies will fade and be crushed. Why would you want to hitch your wagon to a losing proposition? Our text here contains a classic form of civil religion. The marriage, look at our text, we have no king but Caesar. Do you know what that makes room for? That confession, we have no king but Caesar, makes room for Roman paganism and old covenant Judaism. But do you know what it has no room for? Christ. You know what the problem with civil religion is? Is to be Caesar's friend is to reject Jesus, the greatest of all rulers. Jesus is the fulfillment of all of Daniel and Isaiah's prophecies about the king. Can Caesar rule and defend you from all of God's and our enemies? No. And how foolish is the one who hitches their wagon to Caesar? You would reject Christ for civil religion? To do homage to fallen, sinful men? I don't care when I see political rallies of all parties, when I see State of the Union messages, and I, I see men doing everything but bowing and scraping. I don't care if it's Xi or Putin, Washington or Lincoln, Trump or Biden. They are all weak fools. And you would trade your allegiance to Christ for them? Think of the difference. Caesar conquers by force and makes enemies. Jesus conquers by grace and makes sons. Caesar's defenses too. He can never keep his promise that I can, I can keep you safe. Caesar is always overrun by enemies. Where is Caesar now? The original Caesar? His dynasty has been in the trash bin of history for 1,600 years. Jesus is greater because he can protect his people from the fiercest of enemies. He will conquer all his foes and build his kingdom. But even more importantly, to be Caesar's friend is to reject the greatest of needs. You see, Caesar can never supply your greatest need, which is righteousness. Caesar's reign, including all of our rulers, is utterly corrupt. Their lives and dealings are ignorant of Scripture, immoral men and women. But Christ's reign is a righteous reign. He's holy in every one of his dealings, and he gives righteousness freely to his subjects. By application, you say, Carl, I hear you. But I would never fall for civil religion. Not me. Too smart for that. Oh, really? Do you know how you can tell what's most important to people? It's what comes out of their mouth. Because what's in your heart always makes its way to your lips. I can't tell you how many confessing evangelicals I know who I've had 50, 100 conversations where they want to speak about politics. And zero conversations where they want to speak about Christ and his kingship over their life, his rule in their heart. Which do you speak of more? Caesar's kingdom or Christ's? Do you know and study the kingship of Christ and the nature of his kingdom at all? That all the nations and kingdoms of men will fail, but his kingdom will triumph. Civil religionists, when it comes to crunch time, will always confess, we have no king but Caesar. They are stating that they have exclusive loyalty to a pagan government. They'll use Christians for their purposes, but they'll never submit to the kingship of Jesus. So stop hoping in them. Every candidate, every civil magistrate, Sure, submit to their lawful decrees, pay your taxes, but put no trust in them. 
they have no real kinship with you. Stop believing in them. It was John Calvin who said, the only happiness of the godly is to be subject to the kingship of Christ alone. And they can submit to Christ's kingship whether they are under tyrants or a just and lawful government. Let's pray together. Our Father, we come to you only through the blood of our Passover lamb, the Lord Jesus. And we ask that you would instill in us such a profound, singular loyalty to Christ and his kingship that we would never give any credence to the worship of Caesar, but would cling to Jesus alone. We pray in the name of Christ, our only Savior. Amen. Please take your Trinity Psalter hymnals and turn with me to Him 450. So we stand and sing, Jesus, lover of my soul. Grace, mercy, and peace be with you from the God the Father, from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. Amen.